Good afternoon. I'm Carlos Alonso, the acting dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And this is the second of six events in the Research Without Borders series for the 2010-11 uh, academic year, which is sponsored by the Scholarly Communication Program, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and the School of the Arts. Professor Hall will speak, and then we will have time for questions from the audience. Um, I would like to um, announce that uh, we are videotaping the event, so if you have a question for him, please use a microphone in the middle of the room. Gary Hall is Professor of Media and Performing Arts in the School of Art and Design at Coventry University in the UK. He's the author of Culture in Bits, and digitize this book, The Politics of New Media, or Why We Need Open Access Now. He is founding co-editor of the open access journal Culture Machine, director of the Cultural Studies Open Access Archive, Sea Search, co-founder of the Open Humanities Press, and co-editor of OHP's Culture Machine Liquid Book Series. He's currently developing a series of political institutional interventions, recently dubbed, quote, deconstructions in the public sphere, end of quote, which use digital media to actualize or creatively perform critical and cultural theory. He's also involved in the writing of two monographs, Media Gifts, which has been designed as a follow-up to digitize his book, and the Free Libre University toward digital post-humanities. I would like to leave you with a, a teaser which is a quotation from Professor Hall's Digitize This Book, which I encourage you to read because it is a wonderful warning about the, um, the mystification of open access and of uh, digital technologies as a utopian and an inherently democratic and contestatory um, realm. And the quotation reads as follows. Open access cannot always be positioned as being politically progressive in every situation and circumstance for the foreseeable future. Open access may have the potential to be democratic, but as we have seen, it is not always and everywhere democratic in every conceivable situation. Open access also has the potential to be neoliberal, for example. So there's nothing intrinsically or inherently democratic or even political about open access, end of quote. The title of his presentation today is, as you know, Radical Open Access in the Humanities. Thank you very much. Can you hear that? Is that okay? Yeah, loud enough? Okay. So, uh, happy open access week, everyone. I'm not really sure if that's the right term. Is it happy open access? Is it merry open access? I'm going to go with happy open access. Okay, so uh, I'd like to begin by saying thank you to a few people, to the Scholarly Communication Program and the Centre for Digital Research and Scholarship for inviting me, the School of the Arts and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences for co-sponsoring this event, and uh, Catherine Pope, of course, for organising my visit and Carlos Alonso for his very generous introduction. As you know, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is open access in the humanities. And I'm going to focus on the open access publication of books in particular, as they're generally considered, still considered, it may be in the process of changing, the most important mode of publication in the humanities. I'm going to be detailing some of the work that's currently done in this area and some of the issues involved. And to do that, I'll partly concentrate on Open Humanities Press, which is the open access publisher I've helped to co-found. I'm then going to look at some of the forms that the scholarly book-length argument can take when it's, well, A, released from the majority of commercial marketing concerns, and be produced by open, distributed communities of researchers. Okay, but let's begin right at the beginning with open access. Open access is concerned with making peer-reviewed scholarly research available online, for free, 
to all those with internet access. It generally takes one of two main forms. Publishing in online open access peer-reviewed journals, such as Fiber Culture and Culture Machine and Vectors, or in central subject or institutionally based repositories, such as Archive in Physics and Social Science Research Network. In those repositories, authors make their work, and this work may or may not have already been published elsewhere. They make it available by self-archiving digital copies of it. In recent years, however, an increasing number of open access book publishers have emerged too, including some of those you can see here. Bloomsbury Academic, Open Book Publishers, Repress, and so on. However, it's fair to say that the open access movement has progressed much further toward the goal of making all journal articles open access than it has toward making all academics, academic books available in this fashion. And there are at least four reasons for this. The first is that open access has been developed extensively in the STMs, science, technology, and medicine. So the open access movement has concentrated on the most valued mode of publication in those fields, the peer-reviewed journal article. RAE, by the way, stands for Research Ex Assessment Exercise. It's what we do in the UK every five or six years to assess people's research and assign them funds. So the second re reason open access hasn't progressed so far in terms of publishing books is that restrictions to making research available open access associated with copyright, uh, publishers' copyright and licensing agreements can in most cases be legally circumvented when it comes to journal articles. If all other options fail, authors can simply self-archive a pre-refereed, pre-print draft of their article in central subject or institutionally based uh, repositories, such as PubMed Central. Though many publishers now allow authors to archive the refereed and accepted final drafts of their articles, so you don't really have to resort to that. The problem is it's not quite so easy to elude such restrictions when it comes to the publication of academic books. There, because the author is often paid royalties in exchange for their text, copyright tends to be transferred by the author to the publisher. The text remains the intellectual property of the author, but the exclusive right to put copies of that text up for sale or give them away for free then rests with the publisher, which may mean that the author is not legally allowed to self-archive even a pre-print version of their book. Another reason the, the open access movement is focused on journal articles is because of the expense involved in publishing books open access. Since one of the main mod models of funding open access in the sciences, author side fees, is not easily transferable, either to the humanities or to book publishing. The fact is, authors in the humanities are simply not used to paying to have their work published, and they associate doing so with vanity publishing. They're also less likely to obtain the grants from either funding bodies or their institutions needed to cover the cost of publishing author peers. That the humanities receive only a fraction of the amount of government funding the SDMs do only compounds the problem. And that's going to get worse in the UK. The government's rumoured to just not be going to give arts and humanities very much at all. That does the fact that the high rejection rates in the humanities, as compared to the SDMs, mean any grants would have to be significantly larger. And all that's just to publish journal articles. Publishing books, author peers, would be more expensive still. <coughs> 
Fourthly, in contrast to the authors of royalty-free journal articles, book authors were for a long time mistakenly portrayed within much of the open access movement as requiring royalties or fees in exchange for their writings. And this has been unwilling to give their research away for free by making it available open access. However, in recent years, things have begun to change with regard to the publication of open access books. And I want to highlight two changes for you in particular. The first concerns the number of book authors who are recognizing the importance of making copies of their work freely available online. A small number of authors are even refusing to sign any contract that awards copyright or an exclusive license to a publisher and are publishing only with those who bring their book out on a non-exclusive basis that allows them, as authors, to make it available open access by publishing on their own website or in an institutional or subject repository. Other authors are coming to an arrangement with their publishers whereby copies of their book are made freely available online with only the printed version being made available for sale, more or less at the usual price for an academic book. So Ted Striffus here will be an example of an author who's recently published a book with Columbia University Press in this fashion. And still other authors are taking the decision to publish with, open, with an open access publisher right from the start. So Lev Manovich is publishing his new book, Info Aesthetics, with Bloomsbury Academic, while John Carlos Rowe is publishing The Cultural Politics of the New American Studies with us at Open Humanities Press. Why are they doing so? What are the advantages that are offered to book authors by open access? Well, it's true that the mainstream print-only academic publishers and university presses are often positioned as bringing a certain amount of value added to the publishing process. They do so by virtue of their ability to employ professionals to carry out tasks such as proofreading, copy editing, design, publicity, marketing, and distribution. Nevertheless, many academics are coming to the conclusion that the kind of value added a print-only press can supply is insufficient to compensate for the many disadvantages associated with publishing a book in this fashion. These disadvantages include well, the length of time it generally takes for a print-only book published with a mainstream press to appear. This is often anything between nine months and two years after submission of the final manuscript. The high price such presses attach to their books and the effect this has on the accessibility and dissemination of an author's research. Non-open access books are available only at specific times and places, according to bookshop and library opening times, for example and then only to those who can afford to pay for access to them in the form of book cover prices, library subscriptions, and so on. If you're not in an institution in North America, Europe, or Australia, English language titles can be expensive and hard, sometimes impossible, to get. Books published open access, however, are instantly accessible for free, from any desk or laptop, anywhere with, in, with internet access, 24 hours a day. This means open access books are more visible and easier to search for and find, which in turn means they're more likely to be used and consulted, while evidence from the sciences suggests publishing open access significantly increases the amount of text is cited. But there's also the need for conventional academic publishers 
and even university presses to make decisions about what to publish more on the basis of the market and a given text's potential value as a commodity and less on the basis of its quality as a piece of academic scholarship. So many are now more interested in readers, introductions, textbooks, reference works than they are research monographs. The boom in the UK at the moment, for instance, is now for academic stroke trade books focusing on particular films and TV programmes. That's the, what they want people to write. So if you get a younger uh, academic starting out in their career and they submit a really exciting research monograph, they'll tend to get a reply that says, that's really, really exciting, but have you thought of you know, doing a study of The Simpsons or something like that? Which is fine. You can say interesting things about The Simpsons. But. And this last factor is currently making it hard for many authors in the humanities to publish books that are perceived as being difficult, advanced, specialised, obscure, radical, experimental or avant-garde. It's also making it hard for early career academics to publish the kind of research-led monographs that are needed to acquire that all-important first-time, first full-time position. Since they need to have one or two books to get a foot on the career ladder, this means we're in effect letting publishers make decisions on the future of the humanities and who gets positions and who doesn't on an economic basis according to the needs of the market or what they believe those needs to be rather than according to scholarly values. But academics are also publishing open access for ethical and political reasons. Many humanities disciplines like to think of themselves as being politically engaged. Yet the humanities have something of a blind spot when it comes to the politics of the academic publishing industries which actually make them possible, especially as those industries have become increasingly consolidated and profit intensive in recent years. That said, however, more and more humanities scholars are coming to recognize the importance of making copies of their work freely available online because they believe, well, that our commitment to the value of research carries with it a responsibility to circulate it to all those who are interested in it, including those in less affluent parts of the world, rather than restricting access merely to those who can afford it, as we do now. That's the argument John Walensky makes in his book, The Access Principle. But they're also doing so because they believe that doing so helps create a healthy democracy by breaking down barriers between academia and the rest of society and so supplying with the public with the information they need to actively contribute to political debate. Open access is thus seen by some as enabling the production of a global information commons and helping to produce a renewed public sphere of the kind associated associated with Jürgen Habermas. Some have even argued such open resources can help to reassert the Academy's role as a leader and guardian of free and open inquiry and convince the public of the value of universities. As for the question of royalties, the reason I say it was a mistake to position book authors as always requiring royalties in exchange for their writings is because academic titles in the humanities, well, they don't really earn very many royalties at all. In the UK, at least, academic titles in the humanities often only achieve sales of between 200 and 600 copies. So very few authors of academic books actually have much in the way of royalties to lose. Like the royalty-free authors of academic journal articles, the writing in the main for reputation, dissemination, influence and impact, and only indirectly for financial benefit. 
And this is another reason open access is proving attractive to even the so-called for-profit royalty-fee authors of academic books. Because, like the authors of royalty-free journal articles, they too are realising that they stand to gain from the interest in potential readers and exposure that giving their work away for free can bring, as this can lead to an increase in the size of their audience, the level of their reputation, influence, impact and esteem, and thus to greater opportunities for career advancement, promotion, peer rises, funding, consultancies, etc. So one change that has occurred in recent years has to do with the number of authors who are recognising the value of making their books freely available online. The second change I want to highlight concerns the steadily increasing number of publishers that have been set up to make it possible for book authors to publish open access. Now earlier I said that one reason the open access movement is primarily focused on journal articles is because of the cost of publishing books open access. How is it then that these presses can afford to do so? Well, some open access presses are run by scholars on a zero revenue, <coughs> zero expenses basis. Any funding comes indirectly by their institutions paying their salaries as academics. These scholars are simply using some of the time they're given to conduct research to create open access publishing opportunities for others. Now, a common mistake that people make when they hear about this <coughs> is to think, OK, so there are now some open access presses, but if they're run by academics, then they won't have the time, the money, and the expertise to perform tasks such as proofreading, copy editing, and marketing, not to a professional standard anyway. So such scholar-run scholar open access publishers aren't going to be able to offer the same kind of quality as a conventional press. But even if some open access book publishers did decide to save on costs by reducing the amount spent on jobs such as, say, copy editing, and I'm not saying that they do, I'm saying if, it can still be argued that this is a decision worth taking if it enables scholarly books to be made available open access. I'd agree with Peter Suber in this respect when, speaking of open access journals, he says that the best solution is to find enough revenue to pay for copy editing. However, if we have to choose, I would definitely prefer open access without copy editing to copy editing without open access. Yet while some open access publishers are run by scholars on a service to the profession basis, not all open access book publishers are operated entirely or even primarily by academics. Many are themselves professional commercial presses. Bloomsbury Academic, an imprint of Bloomsbury Publishing Group PLC, publishers of Harry Potter, are an example. Other open access publishers are university presses. So Australian National University EPRI Press, for instance, which has produced more than 200 titles in six years. Still others are presses either established by or working with libraries, such as Athabasca University's AU Press, which is part of the Lois Hall Campus Alberta Digital Library, and which lists almost 50 titles in print and online for free on their website. Many scholar-led open access publishers, such as Repress, are even able to generate the money to pay professionals to perform tasks such as proofreading and copy editing by operating on a freemium model Readers can access an open access version of a text online for free, but can then choose to pay, generally at cost price or something reasonably close, if they would like the convenience or experience offered by a print-on-demand edition. Still, for all that, open access in the humanities continues to be dogged by the perception that online publication is somehow less credible than print lacks rigorous standards of quality control. 
and this leads to both open access journals and book publishers being regarded as less trustworthy and desirable places to publish and as too professionally risky for career, early career scholars especially. And it's precisely this perception of open access that Open Humanities Press, the open access publisher I've established with Siggy Yotka and David Otina and Paul Ashton, is being designed to counter. As Siggy Yotkin puts it, OHP's aim is to ensure that open access publishing, in certain areas of the humanities at least, meets the levels of professionalism our peers expect from publications they associate with academic quality. So OHP was launched in May 2008 by an international group of scholars very much in response to the perceived crisis in scholarly publishing whereby academic presses in the humanities have cut back on the number of research-led titles they bring out and libraries are finding it difficult to afford the research that is published, both books and journals. And in the first instance, OHP consisted of a collective of already existing high-quality open access journals in philosophy, cultural studies, literary criticism and political theory. While all these journals are of high quality, many had a problem generating a high level of prestige because they're online journals rather than print and because, although at least two are over 10 years old now, most are relatively new and you can get quality quite quickly but prestige takes longer to build up. So the idea was to bring them together under a single umbrella, that of OHP, and raise their profile and level of prestige in the eyes of academics and administrators by way of a meta-refereeing process. So to this end, and I'll show you the previous slide, to this end OHP is an editorial board that, include, that includes Alan Bardieu, Jonathan Culler, Stephen Greenblatt and Gayatri Spivak, and an editorial oversight group consisting of a rotating body of 13 scholars drawn from the editorial board, which it uses to assess its titles. The plan when we first started was to spend the first few years establishing a name and a reputation for OHP with its journals before proceeding to tackle the more difficult problem of publishing book-length material open access. Difficult for the reasons I've given, because of cost and because in the humanities books published electronically are traditionally not held in particularly high esteem. Things have developed much faster than we anticipated, however. As soon as OHP launched, a lot of people asked us when we were going to publish books. So almost by popular demand, we launched an OHP monograph project, running collaboration with the University of Michigan Library's Scholarly Publishing Office, University of California Irvine, UCLA Library, and the Public Knowledge Project headed by John Wilinski at Stanford University. And the idea is to move forward both open access publishing in the humanities and the open access publishing of humanities monographs. And we've launched our monograph project with five high-profile book series, as you can see. The way it works <coughs> is all of OHP's books are being run through the University of Michigan's scholarly publishing office and their suite of services. They've been made freely available, full text, open access online as HTML, and nearly all of them PDF too. We're also planning to offer print on demand and eventually EPUB books. SPO is subsidizing the production and distributing and distribution costs and providing its services in kind, in keeping with its mission to provide an array of sustainable publishing solutions to the scholarly community. We're looking to use print sales to cover production costs, pay author royalties, and to subsidize, subsidize the cost of other OHP titles. So it's this partnership with SPO that's going to enable us to afford to continue to produce open access books over the long, longer term and to maintain high production standards in the process. Yet for us, it's not just about making books available 
open access. At the moment, the majority of texts that are being produced by open access publishers are still recognisable as books in the conventional sense. And for the most part, OHP is no exception. However, we also want to go a little further than this. Further even than some of those who are already exploring the new forms that book-length scholarly communication can take in the era of open access and online publishing. For example, a number of authors have experimented with making books open to peer commentary at various stages in the writing process. So Mackenzie Walk did this with Game of Theory, while Kathleen Fitzpatrick has recently done something similar with her book, Planned Obsolescence. But in both cases, Walk and Fitzpatrick remain the clearly identifiable authors of these clearly identifiable books. And it's to them that these books are to be attributed. What's more, both of these texts were designed to eventually appear as more or less conventional, hard copy, printed books. A version of Game of Theory came out with Harvard University Press and Planned Obsolescence is forthcoming from New York University Press in 2011. So these projects are still what I call paper-centric. At OHP, we're going one step further than this and experimenting with a series of what we're calling liquid books, edited by myself and Claire Birchall. Like those of Walk and Fitzpatrick, these books provide readers with the opportunity to comment on, respond to, and debate with the text, the author, and other readers. The difference is we're publishing the volum volumes in this series, not just under open access conditions, but free Libra content conditions too. So these books are liquid, not just in the sense they're free for anyone anywhere to read, they're also open on a read-write basis for users to help compose, edit, annotate, translate, and remix them. Hello, I'm Claire Birchall. I'm Gary Hall. And this is our experiment in liquid TV. One of the thinkings behind this whole kind of project was that people often don't get to see how books are put together. Like the rationale behind choosing, say, um, you know, one clip of Derrida on YouTube over another, like why has that one been included? What's important about that? Why is that there? So it almost demystifying the process. We didn't want our reader to be fixed and kind of solid. Uh, we want people to be able to negotiate with it. The idea of these programs, broadcasts, I don't really know what to call them, is that, yeah, maybe we can engage a little bit through this process. Publishers are putting more and more emphasis on people like us to produce texts that, that are going to sell. So if we take, a, uh, if we research a subject and we take a monograph on it, the chances are they're going to say, well, this is all very interesting, but you know, who's going to actually read this? Could you turn it into an introductory textbook that we can sell to first year students and they'd be much more interested in that. It's very hard, harder and harder for people to publish them kind of research, this kind of research led text, particularly if you're not already a name and even then, even then it's harder. But the beauty of this is that you can, that users can also add their own links, their own texts. So there's that real frustration when you're reading a book and you want the reader along with that book that you get to the reader and it doesn't have all the things that you really wanted it yeah. to have. And so this is a chance for you to make the ideal reader to accompany our original book, if you like, for students, for yourself, um, just to make a whole experience out of it. So if somebody, for example, somebody saw our reader and thought, well, that's kind of interesting, but my course is, I can use some of that, but I can't use, you know, these are the texts and what I'd actually like is a text by Latour for example, then they can just do a version of it. Uh, obviously you can't do that with a paper book, you can't do it in terms of scale, uh, you can't do it in terms of cost, and you can't do it in terms of copyright. We can include whatever we want, really, that we can find that, that's out there and it's available online. So we can you know, include annotations, we can include uh, just links to an interesting website, and we can just say, look, this is interesting, you could have a look at this. Welcome to Liquid Theory TV, my name is Claire Birchall, and this is Gary Hall. Ha, ha, ha.
Okay, we'll try not to laugh all the way through. These things, again. no, no, these things you can edit out. Um, so we're going to start by saying a little bit about what on earth we're doing here. Exactly. What are we doing here, Gary? <laughs> The idea is for these liquid books to be produced in an open, collaborative, decentralised, multi-user generated fashion. Not just by, that, by their initial authors and editors, but by a multiplicity of often anonymous collaborators distributed around the world. Indeed, at the time of writing the project, it has over 100 users from Brazil, South Africa, Hong Kong, the Lebanon, Europe, the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, uh, among other places. What's more, their particular form, authors have the freedom to include whole books in their liquid books, along with pages, snippets, references, annotations, yeah. links to related material, even podcasts and YouTube clips, means many of these books can't be published as printed volumes at all. They're more specific to the digital medium than that. All of which is designed to raise a number of challenging and provocative questions. Can we produce critical and cultural theory in this collaborative way? What does it do for ideas of the author, publication, content creation, quality control, even of the book itself? I realise some of you are maybe thinking that all this talk of books authored and edited in a decentralised fashion like this, or anything like a large scale, is an avant-garde fantasy on our part. Yet there's already been a dramatic decentralisation of authorship. <clears throat> One set of figures claims that from the year 1400 onwards, book authorship increased by nearly tenfold in each century. Today, however, authorship, including books and new media, is growing nearly tenfold each year. They have some statistics like by 2016, everyone's going to be authors and things. <clears throat> by the same token, a publication as mainstream as the New York Times has already experimented with decentralised editing in the form of a personalisation platform called My Times that was designed to allow you to select headlines from almost any section and many external sources as well and arrange them on the page in any way you like. And this experiment led the software and audio-visual performance artist Amy Alexander to speculate on the possible long-term effects of such decentralised editing on the importance and value of famous publications such as the New York Times. Now, for Alexander, such a scenario would indeed lead to a dramatic downsizing of the New York Times' authority and status. To be featured in the Times is still regarded by many as an anointment of importance, she writes. But would that same level of importance be perceived if a New York Times story resembles a cross between an Associated Press Wire story and an RSS feed? My question in turn is, could what Alexander predicts for the authority of the New York Times have implications for that of academic stars such as Agamben, Latour, Zizek and so on, and indeed for academic authors in general? Is one of the possible long-term effects of the rapid growth in predicted authorship, coupled to such decentralised and distributed editing, going to be a shift in power and authority here too? not just from the monograph to the collection or reader, but from the academic author to the academic editor or curator or compiler. And with that, will the importance and value of the famous academic publisher of known quality be similarly downsized to the point where publishing with Harvard or Columbia University Press or in journals such as Nature or Die Critics becomes no more sign of importance than appearing in the New York Times does in Alexander's account? Or is there a potential for a change even more profound than that? It's interesting that the shift in authority for Alexander is only from author to editor, 
blogger to compiler. And for me, this is simply to replace one source of authority, the author, with another in the form of the editor or compiler. In which case, it doesn't really bring the authority of the author into question at all. It merely transfers that authority to a different location. Far more interesting is the potential liquid texts have to raise questions for these alternative sources of power and authority too. So we can passively rely on neither the author nor the editor the blogger nor the compiler to provide texts with authority and validity. Rather, we have to take more rigorous and responsible decisions regarding texts, their importance, value, and quality. Not least because the actors that perform these roles, as either authors or editors, are often no longer clearly identifiable, or even always human in the era of Google News. Instead, both the author and the editor functions are decentered and distributed across a multiplicity of often anonymous actors with often unknown qualifications and credentials. Even more radically still, it's not just the identity and authority of the author and editor that such decentralized and distributed, distributed editing potentially brings into question. It's that of the work itself. For instance, one thing this project could be said to be doing is decentering the author and editor functions, making everyone potential authors and editors. In this respect, the Liquid Book series can be positioned as addressing an issue ra raised by net theorist Gert Loving. Why are wikis not utilized more to create, develop, and change theory and theoretical concepts? Instead of theory, for all its rethinking of concepts, such as writing, the author, the subject, the text, I might add, continuing to be considered the terrain of the sole author who contemplates the world, preferably offline, surrounded by a pile of, pile of books, a fountain pen, and a notebook. To provide an example, in his book, The Soul at Work, Franco Bifo Berardi shows how for Italian compositionist workerism, the science of social transformation is much closer to the chemistry of gases than to the mechanics of sociology. There are no compact forces, unitary subjects that promote unequivocal wills, he writes. There's no subject opposing other subjects, but the transversal, transversal flows of imagination, technology, desire. Before proceeds to combine workerist theories with the schizoanalysis of Deleuze and Guattari, develop a concept of the subject as a violent imposition on a chaotic world composed of a flow of molecules. Yet the question to remain, remains, to what extent is this schizoid understanding of the subject being enacted by before himself in his actual role and identity as an author here? Doesn't his text, in this case his printed paper, book, The Soul at Work, very much remain that of an individualized liberal humanist male in its mode of creation, composition, accreditation, publication, dissemination. At the same time, in What is an Author, Michel Foucault warns that any attempt to avoid using the concept of the individualized human author to close and fix the meaning of a text risk leading to a limit and a unity being opposed in another way by the concept of the work. So we may have raised questions for conventional notions of the author by making our liquid books available under open editing and free Libra content conditions. But to what extent does the ability of users to rewrite, remix, and reversion these books render untenable any attempt to impose a limit and unity on them as works. And what are the political, ethical, and social consequences of such liquidity for ideas that depend on the concept of the work for their effectivity? Those concerning individualized attribution, citation, copyright, intellectual property, fair use, academic success, promotion, and so on. We wanted to use a wiki for raising such questions because the networked, distributed structure of wikis 
It means anyone anywhere can potentially join in, publish, and participate. And this last point is especially important with regard to the center periphery model of the geopolitics of knowledge. Speaking of research without borders. In this model, there are just a few nations at the center of the global academic and publishing networks who are exporting and, in effect, universalizing their knowledge. And interestingly enough, this is the case with even the most radical of theoretical works, works which, in their content, explicitly try to undermine such center-periphery models. Take those of Michel Foucault. Foucault writes and publishes books of philosophy in Paris. They're picked up by the US and UK publishing networks, translated into English, and his theories of power, governmentality, biopolitics, and care of the self are then exported around the world. Meanwhile, there are a host of nations outside the center of the global academic and publishing networks who, while they may be able to import universalized knowledge, don't have enough opportunities to publish, export, or even develop their own universal knowledge to rival that of Foucault, or Badiou, Ranciere, Deleuze, or whoever happens to be flavor of the month at the moment. There are various reasons for this. Their language may be a minority one. People working in these countries often don't have the kind of access to the amount and quality of research literature is taken for granted by those closer to the center of the geopolitics of knowledge, which need to be referenced for research to be accepted by international journals and publishers and their peer reviewers. Nor do they have the kind of local academic or publishing networks that can help them get read and cited, and so produce, develop, support, and disseminate their work in the first place. At most, these scholars may get to export empirical data, which provides local detail that can be used to flesh out the universal knowledge of those closer to the center of the geopolitical knowledge networks. Now, the wiki medium of communication can be of assistance when it comes to avoiding the reproduction of this state of affairs, it seems to us not by enabling us to place more emphasis on the so-called periphery, say by privileging contributions from outside the centre. That says in 2004, 90% of the world's scientific research was done by just 15 countries. So we're not trying to place more emphasis on the so-called periphery. There'd be a real risk with that of maintaining that centre-periphery self-other model. The use of the wiki medium of communication can be assistance because it makes it possible to produce a multiplicitous academic and publishing network, one with a far more complex, fluid, distributed, and decentered structure. The Liquid Book series therefore has the capacity to be extremely pluralistic. We could even have multilocational, multipolar, multimedium multiple identity books if we wanted, which is something I'm currently working on with my Media Gifts project. We can talk about that later if you like. Indeed, what's interesting about some of the changes and developments in digital publishing that I've described for you today is not just that more books are now available open access, nor that with the emergence of the likes of Scribd, Blurb, Issue and Lulu, Publishing a book is something that nearly everyone can do today in a matter of minutes. Nor even that as a result, book publishing is steadily becoming more like blogging or vanity publication. With certification provided as much by an author's reputation or readership or the number of times a text is downloaded, cited, referenced, linked to, blogged about, tweeted about, bookmarked, ranked, or indexed, and this in effect recommended by others in what amounts to a process of collaborative evaluation, as it is by conventional peer review or the prestige of the press it's published with. 
Now, the really interesting thing about all this is the way it encourages us to think differently about the book itself. As something that's not fixed and unified with definite limits and clear material edges, but rather liquid and living. Constantly open to being annotated, edited, updated, and reimagined, with publication no longer being conceived as an endpoint or fixed moment in time, but simply as a node in an ongoing process or flow. So much so that perhaps we'll soon no longer call such things books at all, e or otherwise. On the other hand, perhaps book is as good a name for such things as any. Since I'd argue books have always been like this. Books have always been living and liquid. Digital technology has simply helped to make us more aware of the fact. That's all. Thank you very much. Put the last one up. Um, 33% of the instructional force nationally in the United States is not tenure track. In other words, 67% of the instructional force in higher education right now is not required to produce research. It's co contracted exclusively for serving as a, a teaching uh, class, let's say. Um, and it, it seems to me that, that what you may be trying to do is create more outlets, more diversified um, venues for a kind of knowledge that the academy itself is, is beginning to phase out, in a, in a sense. Um, it may be that the um, kind of knowledge that is produced by the humanities has lost its legitimacy in the, in the uh, commodification of everything to the point that um, there is there is no way in which to rearticulate value for the kind of knowledge that, that uh, the humanities produces um, so that, that in fact what we may be doing by um, having, uh, by implementing some of the recommendations of the, the uh, digital humanities for instance is to, to produce more venues for a kind of knowledge that is at some level already hollowed out by the dynamics of the, uh, of the university. And I know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm wondering um, if the, 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 the um, concentration of the discussion on the academic context, when that context seems to have already made a bet that that kind of knowledge is not going to be part of its future, uh, is, is productive? Yeah, that's a great question, very uh, important question. Uh, it's a big one as well to try and, to, <clears throat> to try and answer. Um, okay, I suppose the first thing to say would be, uh, you mentioned digital humanities. I don't know how much people know about the di digital humanities. Um, I suppose I, in the moment I'm working, I'm writing on the digital humanities, I'm trying to work out my position in relation to the digital humanities. And the digital humanities is not one thing, it's a whole set of fields, it's not even a field, it's you know, uh, doing lots of different things. But one of the things I'm curious about is the tendency within the digital humanities to do very much what you're talking about. So it promotes a very instrumental, performative kind of knowledge. So you'll get techniques and approaches from computing science and say, look, we can digitize the whole works of Chopin and then we can you know, read through it and look, look at the data that we can get out of that. Uh, and I'm kind of curious about that because on the one hand I want to be open 
to people doing new things and exploring new kinds of knowledge. On the other hand, yeah, uh, there's a part of me that's kind of, okay, so we've, as we were talking before, we've digitized that, we've got this data out of it, so what, is that it? It's just for us to be more efficient, more performative, more instrumental. It seems that the humanities in that particular uh, narrow aspect of the digital humanities is taking on very much you know, the, what we're taking from the sciences, what the government's telling us to do, what business is telling us to do. It's like, search this, do that. So one of the things I'm trying to work out with a lot of my projects is, can we think of a digital humanities that would be different, that would be what we would think in the humanities is more interesting than that, without kind of the flip side to that as going back to, we all need to read more books and really long books and disappear for days on end and just really study, because otherwise our brains are all gonna get this kind of neurological turn and we won't concentrate on anything. And we've all got to be like Jonathan Franzen and look ourselves away for 10 years in a room and fasten up our, you know, our uh, laptop ports and saw things off so no one can use them and never be tempted by anything again. Um, can we you know, not go to either extreme? Can we work, make this kind of stuff, the digital, work for us in terms of the humanities? Your question about uh, you know, the humanities and we've kind of already lost the battle and what can we do? Well. It just so happens that uh, it's, uh, I was going to give an anecdote about Blue Peter, which is a children's program where they always bring something on and say, ah, here's one I made earlier. But uh, I am working, because one of the things we've been thinking about, we've, you know, we did a journal and we did an archive and we're doing kind of liquid books and a whole publisher. So we're kind of thinking, can we scale this up a little bit? So the next project that we're thinking is we want to do, can we do a whole, if you like, open access university? Can we make all of this kind of available for free? And it gets to the heart of some of the things that you started off by talking about in terms of, you know, um, you know, my generation, and God, I always sound like I'm old, but my generation is probably maybe the last generation that's working at the universities that has, you know, any time to give away. You know, maybe this is the most invaluable thing that we can do. Maybe, you know, rather than any of the other things we can be spending our time on, maybe just giving away some time. So one of the things we're doing is setting up an institution where uh, we're asking people, or we will be asking people, that instead of working and giving your labor for free to academic journals or publishers who are then gonna charge quite a lot of money for people to get their products, don't do that. Give your time and labor, maybe an hour a week. If enough people did it, it could be just as little as an hour a week to support a whole open access institution where we can continue to teach the kind of humanities that we're interested in and think is important, even in uh, situations as such as you described, where the situation is not, uh, we're not thinking it's very advantageous to the continuation of the humanities. And the, already in the UK, uh, just over the last few weeks, or even just the, you know, the time I've been here, people are talking about the privatization of the humanities. And how are we going to continue to do the humanities? The government isn't prepared to fund that anymore because it precisely wants to go over to the sciences and maths and medicine, and it wants us to do, you know, do that kind of digital humanities that I was talking about, that computational turn, that data mining version of it. Um, how can we continue to find a space where we'll still ask the kind of questions that most of us are interested in doing? Can we do that? Um, We'll have to do this, I'm guessing, uh, at lower cost because we're not going to have the funds. Um, but in, in the UK, it's, you know, people are talking about it in terms of a class issue. People won't be able to afford to go to universities anymore. They won't get that money. So there'll be a whole section of society that can't have access to this kind of education. Can we give them that, as I say, rather than spending your time peer reviewing for journals that are then going to charge, uh, I missed the slide, but they're going to charge, you know, quite a bit. I've got a bit of time, I'll go through, back through the slides. They're gonna charge you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to get those journals. Can we give our time, energy, into making a different kind of institution possible? That's what we're gonna work on, anyway. It's kind of hard to improvise this whole new university, but I don't have to talk about it here. The Benjamin quote that you put up, I gather you put it up as, as something of an epigram since you didn't, the, the final slide with the Benjamin yeah. quote. Uh, and yeah. it says here, he says that everything that matters is to be found in the card box of the researcher who wrote it. 
I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's something that you in fact believe, you know, having put this up as what I'm assuming is an epigram, because it seems to me one of the things that open access does is allows the scholar to maintain better control of his or her intellectual property. And the intellectual property, to me, of a scholar is the interpretation that he or she uniquely applies to that gathering of facts. If it's just a gathering of facts, a computer algorithm could scan books, scan the web, and gather those. So I'm wondering if you could address that yeah, a little. Sure. Thanks. OK. Um, another great question. Uh, this, this is a quote from One Way Street. Uh, and I was kind of putting that there to say, look, this is all not just about the digital. This hasn't just happened with the emergence of digital technology. Uh, you know, people were already talking about the book in these kind of fluid, liquid terms uh, back in 1928. Uh, the other quote I sometimes use uh, refers to Shakespeare and his first folio, which if you look at it, it's, you know, there is no one definitive answer or version of that. It's got a whole lot of different settings and typefaces and spellings and it's, you know, it's not fixed. These books, these texts aren't fixed. They're much more fluid and it is kind of an interpretation. Um, yes, one version of, of open access would be that it helps the scholar maintain their resources. It m helps them in kind of traditional uh, ways of, of working. Why I'm slightly pushing towards that is precisely because of the issues that were raised in the first question about, you know, I just don't want this to be an instrumental thing. I don't think we should use, you know, Prezi. As, have you seen that uh, mode of, instead of PowerPoint, it's a kind of a, uh, a, a way that you put everything on screen at once and it kind of go, it always makes me car sick, but, you know, people swoop around and use that. Or, you know, or Delicious or all those tools. I think they're great and they're kind of useful, but I'm wary of are we going to just get down to using these things as, in terms of instrumental terms, of making the humanities, we can do more, faster, quicker, better. For me, it's, you know, is that what we want the humanities to be? It's just that, performing better. It's about asking these kind of questions. It's about pushing what we understand the humanities uh, are, what, you know, the kind of questions that we should have been asking anyway, but digital uh, technology pushes us towards and just thinking about what the humanities are going to be in the digital era without falling into that trap of, you know, we're going to data mine masses and masses of texts or going back into that reactionary, we all need to get back to reading Middlemarch and really concentrating on it with our students, which is great. Yeah, like Middlemarch as well. Microphone designed for tall people. Um, Gary, I really enjoyed your talk. I wanted to just push a little bit at what seemed to be a kind of, a little bit of a tension in the talk between what I take to be the very radical and egalitarian premises with which you ended and the beginning insistence on like, of course, everything's going to be peer reviewed. And how do, how do we, how do we me melt that? Right? I mean, so that, I mean, to, previous question wants to say that there's this unique interpretation out there. I'm wondering whether, whether that's still true in, in, in light of the kind of, the kind of discussion you've outlined here. Do we need, do we still need, if, we, if you're not content with the Ken Walk, Kathleen Fitzpatrick kind of crowdsourcing, what do we need in terms of response? Do we need, if the peer review thing is at least two guys sitting in their room somewhere quietly reading and deciding on some probably arbitrary basis, they feel like they had a headache that day. The guy doesn't cite them in the footnotes. There's a reference to somebody they don't like and the thing gets turned down. That strikes me, when you look at that percentage difference between why humanities is so rejection happy compared to the sciences. <laughs> I wonder whether that's because all the work in the humanities is so crappy compared to the sciences or whether we're just like, you know, very, very kind of petty minded about it. Scientists are much more noble-minded and they don't get involved in such things. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and the following question from that would be then, are there ways to do the research online? I mean, the project, I've been trying to construct a climate change project that's putting the work online as I do it. Have you, come, have you done any work in that area of like, rather than just waiting until it's done and then shoving it up, have you thought about ways in which the research itself can be conducted in a collaborative online format? Yes, uh, okay, so I'll start with the tension that you talked about. Um, 
Uh, and I always feel this tension because uh, I get invited to events like this and I get invited to come and speak about open access and I'm an advocate and supporter of open access. I think it's really important. Um, uh, and there's a certain issue, and this is where the tension comes in, of, of a question of strategy. Um, I want people to publish open access and I think it's really important. And I know that people, are, you know, that in itself for a lot of people is radical enough. I mean, that's a big jump. Uh, and so a lot of people in the open access movement think you know, that's as far as we should go. We should just push and say we've got to publish open access and that's it. Um, and the, the other side, the other half that you talked about, which is intentionless, is going to kind of frighten the horses a little bit. And people who are already nervous about open access, and they're going to, I'm talking about liquid books and different kinds of peer reviewing, and they're going to, oh, see, this is where it's going to lead us. This is the kind of trouble that we're going to get into. Let's not go down that road at all. And I don't agree with that. I think... Uh, we should publish open access. There's nothing to be scared about. We can work it out. Most of the open access movement, most of open access publications are peer reviewed in very traditional ways. There isn't a question. I'm raising these questions because I'm interested in it. I think, you know, I would say that I'm pushing this. I'm not leaving open access behind. I'm not moving beyond it. I'm kind of pushing its philosophy to its limits, if you like, working through. I mean, these are questions that are already in open access. You know, people just don't a ask them because either they're not interested in them or it's a question of strategy. Are there different ways of, of peer reviewing? I mean, it's all, when I'm talking about this, when I'm questioning the author, questioning notions of book, it's not to say that there are just no limits and it's all kind of a mess and it's chaos and things. Of course, we're gonna make different decisions. We're not trying to get rid of authorship. What we're trying to say is we need to, these are things that uh, we've taken for granted. We don't really ask questions. Even, you know, I work in cultural theory and we've been through, you know, Bart and Lacan and Derrida and all of those people, but everyone still works kind of the same. We might think that we're questioning the author, but we still act, and this is the example I was using with before, we still act as very traditional liberal humanist authors. Now, what I'm saying is, that's not kind of natural and fixed. We can act differently. We can think of different ways to do it. And that's all we're trying to do, kind of uh, loosen that up a little bit. What I'd like is not to say, have I got the answer and I'm going to come and say, this is what we should do. I think we just need to experiment. And it's the same with different kinds of institutions. We're going to have to experiment with what this technology can do, how we can use it. There's not going to be one answer. But unless we start experimenting with it, we're never really going to find out. There's lots and lots. I'm going to send you lots of examples of different forms of peer review. Um, I think it's Biomed Central have uh, this, this system, uh, what they call, it's more than a thousand, but they have a thousand peer reviewers, and uh, what they do is nominate over a certain period what they think is the most interesting articles that have appeared in that time, and they kind of push those forward. And so they're kind of trying a different system, a more collaborative, collective bigger system of doing that. But there's lots of different examples of peer review that we can kind of work with. With liquid books, we're making it a lot more open. Not because we're not going to make any judgments. We just want to say, firstly, to say, look, the judgments that we're taking, you know, try and um, show that they're not just natural and fixed, that we can't change them and make different kind of judgments. And just try and mush, move to that other side where we're going to see what happens. How can we judge more? collaboratively, uh, collectively produced texts, what are they going to look like? How would we still maintain notions of quality and value? I should stress, because um, they'll not be very, uh, very pleased with me if I don't, OHP has very kind of traditional peer review system. The way it's organized might be kind of avant-garde and radical, but it's system, this is why we've got, you know, I show all the, the slides with all the kind of heavyweight hitters. It's kind of very traditional, serious, that's the point of it. That's the strategy. If we don't have that, then people will still have that attitude of pu publishing open access and publishing books open access is it's kind of not serious, it's not proper, we can't afford to do it, it's not legitimate, it's not quality control. It is. I mean, probably more than a lot of print on paper publishers. So. Hi, I have a question. Thank you for your talk. Very interesting um, and noble experiment. I, my question is, there was a sentence you said somewhere in there that eventually you wanted to have the print sales cover 
the costs of this. Yeah. And I, I'm from Columbia University Press, so I oh. deal daily with this difficult, uh, sure. this dilemma we have about market. You know, we'd love to publish a certain book, but we think we would sell 200 copies and there's no way we could cover our costs, so we have to say no. And that's what this kind of thing, I think, has the potential to, um, to change. But right now, it sounds as though the University of Michigan is essentially paying your, a lot of your, whatever overhead you have, you've stripped it down, people are doing the work for free, whatever office you have would be covered by the university and then the website, and you wouldn't have presumably marketing costs because you're doing those, you're sending out emails or however you're, sure. You're doing it on the website. So you're, so you're stripping down a lot of costs, but eventually there are costs. I mean, you're being paid a salary um, not to do this work, but to do something else. So what, I guess what I'm getting at is that universities have to recognize that there are, that they would have to cover the costs of this kind of publication. Um, sure. Because I don't think, I mean, and that was the one thing I was skeptical about. I don't think that you're, print costs will subsidize, especially if you're not looking at market at all, because you won't get enough copies of these obscure research um, monographs. You know, probably you might sell five or 10, or maybe even 100, but even if you sold 100 at a relatively reasonable price, you wouldn't cover those costs if you sure. broke them down. Okay. I was pleased to hear there was only the one thing you were skeptical about. That was, <coughs> that was quite nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, hold on, I'm just trying to find the slide where we have the repress people. It's a bit slow. Get there eventually. Okay. Nearly there. Come on. Okay. Um, yes, it's like my worst nightmare, isn't it? Uh, people just say, oh, there's just this one sentence in your text, and then from, you know, Columbia uh, University Press. Okay, so, um, yes. The question of costs and uh, maintaining all this. Yeah, well, I mean, one of uh, the people that I founded OHP with, which is Paul Ashton, he also runs Repress. Um, and they pretty much work on just that model, that model of um, make the, the, the online version free, open access, and then they're getting money from the print-on-demand version. And what they're finding is it does just about cover their costs. Um, they publish people like Alain Badiou, who there's you know, a little, uh, what should we say, uh, almost a cult around, and a very enthusiastic people who like his books and want to own their own personal copies so they can have them on their shelves. So maybe it's to do with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the titles that they're focusing on. But they're finding it just about uh, covers their cost. But look, it's a big question, a uh, big issue. I'm not saying that I've got the answer to how uh, presses like Columbia University Press are going to solve this problem. I suppose one thing that a lot of people involved with open access are going to say is, well, you're not going to, you know, it can't carry on the way it is because that's not really working either. I mean, I can give you lots of radical things that I think should happen. For example, um, you know, in, in the UK, the government's always telling us that we, uh, <coughs> that we're in a knowledge society and universities help make the economy and they're founding businesses. Well, you know, if we're so useful to businesses and they're not paying for any of this, because businesses don't pay us to do the research. Uh, you know, they're just taking that research and building their businesses and getting their money out of it. Well, you know, why don't they start funding some of universities and funding some of the arts and humanities and giving the money back and giving money to people to publish research like this? But hey, uh, that's kind of what I would say. Um, another argument is that instead of every library, uh, this is an argument made by David Otina, another colleague of mine at um, OHP. Instead of what happens is libraries try and buy an individual copy of every book that's kind of published 
in the world that they're interested in, and then they've got to ship it to their buildings, and then they've got to store it and kind of look after that. Maybe you've got to switch that process. Instead of universities, and I'm trying to get my institution to do this, and I've had meetings about it, and they didn't kick me out of the room. Um, what I'm saying is, uh, instead of trying to suck all this research in from everywhere, if every institution funded, used that money to just publish their own academics, and then you just pushed it out and made, avail made it available open access, then we'll all have access to this research you know, for free. It would all be there. We'd all have it. You wouldn't have the problem of, kind of storing it and looking after it and shipping it. That would be another way of running that, this kind of system and this kind of organization that would make it possible to work. Yeah. And, and oh. also, just to add to that, if um, the um, in departments and administrators who are granting tenure would stop uh, insisting on a physical book, sure. because that's, I mean, Badiou, you'll sell enough print-on-demand copies to make it work and more, but a revised dissertation in a relatively obscure topic is not going to do that. And most people don't even want the physical book. They want to search in it and then yeah. put it away. So that's been the, uh, a big stumbling block. Yeah, and it's partly why we adopted the strategy that we did with Open Humanities Press of, of going for you know, more established names. Because you think, well, okay, to change that, you know, if we get a lot of young, uh, younger scholars who are all very familiar with Twitter and all this kind of thing, then those kind of committees and institutional bodies are not going to change. But if you get big hitters who are saying, hey, this is important, this is what we should do. And, you know, they're coming to us because they've been through the traditional system and they're running out of enthusiasm for it in a lot of cases. But, you know, uh, I don't want to position it as open humanities press or open access versus the likes of Columbia University Press. I mean, you know, I love books. I love print on paper books. It's thanks to people like Columbia that I get to read them. It's not, you know, it's not this hostile either or thing. I wasn't even trying to work. No, no, I wasn't. I was just trying to make that clear. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so we're all straight on open access now, no problems. <laughs> we're all going to go away and make all our things available online, yes. <laughs> that would be really great, yeah. Any last questions? Anybody on Twitter that wants to say something? <laughs> I wonder whether this is really limited to actually, not limited, but whether it's not here. You know, people are already using open access actually more effectively because you have much smaller community. So that actually getting things into print it's not, it hasn't been working for these fields in a long time because it was too expensive. If you look at what the Oriental Institute in Chicago, for example, is doing, they putting everything out as digital copy, making it accessible through their websites. And it is my impression, I'm not in necessarily in such a small field, but for instance, ancient archaeology. These are the people who are using extremely effectively uh, web and digital publication ways of actually reaching each other in the most dispersed spots on, on the planet, and I wondered whether some of the issues you were describing are more related to the scale that humanities in major languages are sort of not having the push that the sciences are having, but still they are much more powerful than small fields, and thus they might not squeeze them in the middle. Sure. Um, there's, there's lots of issues involved. Uh, a lot of people come to us, uh, like someone is uh, we're talking to someone about publishing a classics series or a classics kind of strand um, via Open Humanities Press. And they're coming to us because they're a kind of small field, but there isn't a market via the traditional publishers for that field. They can't get them to take their books because traditional publishers are having to, you know, at least make ends meet. Uh, if not make a profit, and so it's harder and harder for them to get the kind of books that they want published, so they're coming to us as a means of doing that. So that's kind of one reason why uh, people are turning to open access. We were having a discussion between us and the open humanities people, and there's a certain push with um, certain parts of the world, P parts of the world, you know, probably not uh, the UK or America, but places who, where they feel a little bit on the margins, so there's a lot of open access things happening in Australia, for example, 
And one of the things people were saying is, well, maybe because they feel quite far away and it's hard to get their things distributed and out there, so this is a really good uh, way of doing that. So there's lo lots of reasons why particular fields uh, are going for it. The sciences have dominated it, um, uh, again, for various reasons, because it's easy, as I was saying, with journal articles. There's also a sense where they were, they were already exchanging preprints of their work, because if you're in science, there's a certain... Uh, importance and status attached to being the first to discover something and you know, um, you know in, there's a sense of if you discover a cure for cancer it's important to kind of get it out there quite quick rather than if I produce a really interesting reading of Deleuze you know if it takes 18 months for that to come out I think it's a great loss but you know most of the people would prioritise one than the other. So there's a sense where the sciences have always been much quicker to get this stuff out. They're, they're much, they want to share it. They're already circulating it. So something like an open access repository like Archive just kind of formalised that or made that possible. Okay. Uh, I have the question, to what extent the um, scholars from developing countries or rising powers are involved in this? Because quite obvious... Cost is a major issue here, and it would seem that they should be very important actors and, and collaborated in this open access effort. Sure. Um, again, there's not one blanket answer to that. So somebody like Ngugi is interested. Ngugi is, a, 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 in case you didn't know, he was a, he's a novelist, writer. He was up for the Nobel Prize this year. We were a bit disappointed that he didn't get it. That would have been great to have someone in OHP with a Nobel Prize. Um, uh, and so he made a decision some time ago, uh, he comes from Kenya, and he made a decision that he wouldn't uh, write in English anymore uh, because you know, that's the colonial language and he was uh, just going to write in um, Kukuyu, his, uh, his language. Uh, and so we're publishing that series with him, uh, but also he's going to write in those languages and publish, but it's not going to be just from that language translated into English or translated into a French. It would be from that language into another language that is you know, outside the centre of those kind of knowledge uh, and publishing networks. Um, but again, uh, and Carlos started with that quote about open access, it's not kind of, uh, it's not this thing that sometimes people in open access have this moralistic, it's an inherent good and we have to kind of roll it out everywhere. It isn't. A lot of people uh, in South America, for example, uh, are nervous about open access and cautious and sometimes when I go to open access conferences the why governments are behind it is because they think you know I go to conferences in Europe and they're saying we have to get our knowledge out there we have to compete with the Americans we have to make ourselves noticed on the global market and they think we have to have our knowledge dominant and it has to be out there uh, and so people in some places of the world that are outside that see this as just a way of the West, the North, making their knowledge dominant and getting out there. Uh, so there's certain people that are cautious, which is why I was talking about having different kind of networks and different kind of publishing centers that makes it possible that you have a multinodal network. So it's not just open access makes you know, uh, North America or Europe or the UK and their knowledge out there, that there are other parts of the world that can, can start publishing their research and, and globalizing that, if you like. 